Welcome to the Pivot Clean Energy Podcast, How the World Cooks, the energy shift you need to know about. I'm your host, Alicia el On this podcast, we are going to explore everything cooking, how it impacts the world, and why you should care. Let's go. Doug Bourbon joined POET in March of 2003 and has served the organization in several key roles since then. In his current role as Vice President of Corporate Affairs, Doug promotes the corporate objectives of POET, the importance of agriculture, and the benefits of biofuels domestically and internationally. Doug currently sits on the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance Executive Committee and Board, the Fuels Institute Advisory Board, is a Senior Advisor to Solutions from the Land, is the executive director of the South Dakota Ethanol Producers Association, is team leader on the U.S. Grains Council Ethanol Advisory Team, and serves on several other industry-associated work groups, committees, and associations. He also manages strategic corporate relations for POET, promotes state, national, and international policy objectives for the industry, and is a recognized authority on biofuels, renewable energy, and agriculture. Today, we get to hear from that wealth of experience and expertise on a topic that can be controversial in the biofuels world, food versus fuel. We are going to explore the growth of bioethanol in the U.S. and how it has shaped rural economies over the past four decades and impacted our food systems. And then we are going to pivot to the global south and explore the challenges of food insecurity of how bioethanol could actually improve those dynamics rather than threaten the food supply. We discuss the innovative technology, regulatory environment, and supply chain dynamics that could help shape the future of the global south and see a huge shift in agriculture, allowing many countries to successfully produce their own food and fuel. Doug, welcome to How the World Cooks. Hi, Alicia. How are you doing? Good. We are so thrilled to have you today. We are going to discuss something today that you are very familiar with and speak to regularly, but it can be a controversial topic and it's often plagued with misinformation. And that topic is food versus fuel, which we're going to explain and dissect throughout this interview. So if you don't know what that is, don't worry, you're going to get an education. So let's get started. Um, I want to provide just a bit of context first. So starting with your background and where you're coming from, you are currently the VP of Corporate Affairs at Poet, and you've been with the company for a number of years. Um, Poet was also one of the initial members of Pivot, and so you've been around and contributing as a board member since the start. For those who might be unfamiliar, can you just give us a brief background on who Poet is? Sure. Well, Poet uh, is the largest biofuel producer in the world. We produce about 3 billion gallons of bioethanol on an annual basis, about 14 billion pounds of distillers grains, about 975 uh, million pounds of corn oil, and we produce about 5% of the U.S. food grade CO2. Um, And all that comes from our 34 plants in eight states. Um, we've been around for about 38 years now, I guess, and, uh, we have 2,400 team members. Um, it's also interesting to note that we buy about a billion bushels of corn annually. Our company does. That's about 7% of the U S corn crop. And of that corn, obviously we make bioethanol, but we also make the feed portion. So as we're talking about food versus fuel, it's really important to understand that when we buy corn, we are not consuming the corn. We're only transferring the starch of the ethanol or the starch of the corn plant uh, to ethanol. All of the other nutrient components of that corn go right back to the markets where it's originally grown for Hmm. in the first place. But that's a little bit about... Poet, and and we do, you know, we're a little bit unique in the industry in that we do everything under one roof. So we have, uh, we do all of the design construction for our plants. We do all of the management for our plants, marketing of the ethanol, marketing of the distillers grains, R&D. So we're really a one-stop shop for everything Hmm. to do with uh, bioethanol, biorefining, and bioprocessing. Wow. Yeah, very impressive. And also, um, for those who know anything about Poet or have been following them, 
um, there's a lot of innovation that's always happening as well. So always looking for new products to put into the market or efficiencies, optimization and whatnot in the company as well. And um, so that's really a neat thing to see. Yeah, and so how long have you been? Oh, I'm sorry. I was no, just going to say ahead. we have a real advantage in in size and in that mm -hmm. scope in that we do everything under one roof. It makes us, you know, kind of a primary target for new technologies. We can't do everything on our own by any means. We don't we sure. don't pretend to do that. But, you know, folks that want to make bioplastics out of uh, ethanol or something like that, they're going to they're going to come to pull it because we have the largest streams available in the marketplace. So we get we get mm. to see an awful lot of new technology on a very regular basis. And that makes it very exciting. Yeah. So cool. How long have you yourself been with the company and how did you actually get started working at Poet? I've been here uh, just about 22 years now. Um, okay. I started in 2003. Um, my background just prior to starting with Poet, I was in the real estate development business and we built uh, hotels and restaurants, apartment buildings, some C stores, and then we had a very similar model to what um, what Poet was at the time in that we would buy the land, we would write the business plan, we would determine what would go on that land, um, we would manage it and market it, all those different types of things. And I think that was interesting to Jeff, our CEO, um, had a, a similar model that we're doing in, in different areas of business. And um, so Jeff hired me and, um, you know, I've done a number of things from refinancing plants here to business development, to uh, writing business plans, et cetera. And my role is in corporate affairs now, I would say is more of a chief advocate for our, our company, our product, our industry all around the world. So I sit on a number of industry association boards um, and I do a lot of messaging for mm -hmm. exactly what we're doing today. I, we exactly. try to get the message out because it's a critical message and people around the world, I don't think understand agriculture well enough. Um, mm -hmm. or maybe don't see it from the right angle sometimes. So that's what I try to do. Yeah. And what a great message it is. You had mentioned that, you know, yes, Poet is the largest bioethanol producer, but they produce a lot more than just bioethanol. And I, I know a lot of listeners aren't maybe familiar with that. We've touched on it in previous podcasts, but there are a lot of different bioproducts that come out of a corn fed bioethanol plant. So can you just expand on some of those and how they actually benefit um, all these other markets within the U.S. and globally? Sure. Well, let's just start with bringing corn into an ethanol plant. We bring corn in. Um, we mash that. And it goes into a fermenter, and out of the fermenter, we have solids and liquids. Um, the solids are the protein, fiber, um, and the liquids are ethanol, um, or bioethanol, as we like to call it, corn oil. Um, and so there are different markets for each of these. Most of the bioethanol that, that we produce goes into the light-duty uh, fleet market for fuel. Um, 10% of the U.S. Uh, gasoline pool is made up of ethanol. I don't know if everybody knows that, but you're putting 10% ethanol into your car almost every time you fill up, um, regardless of where you are in the country. There are a few places that have um, ethanol-free gas, but not that doesn't sell very well because it's much mm -hmm. more expensive than gasoline with ethanol in it. And then the other components, we talk about distillers grains a lot. We produce 14 billion pounds of distillers grain. Now that is a, a protein concentrate that is used in livestock feed for the most part. So it goes to, a lot of it goes to poultry, some of it goes to fish, dairy, swine, um, cattle, you name it. But um, 99% of all the corn grown in the United States is number two yellow dent industrial corn that goes toward feed for the most part. 
Well, right now, actually more of it goes to the bioethanol production than goes to feed, believe it or not. Mm. But we don't deplete the feed. We enhance the feed because obviously we don't consume the corn. So that's really important. When people talk about food versus fuel, uh, just the saying is a misnomer. We produce food and fuel. So we mm. don't deplete the world of nutrition. We enhance the world of nutrition. Uh, and that's a critical component. Now, I'll give you an example. In India, they have recently um, they have recently mandated a twenty percent ethanol blend in their fuel, and they have they are in the process of banning sugarcane from being being the feedstock to make ethanol from. Corn and sugarcane are the two main feedstocks for ethanol, um, but sugar is so important in India. When you bring in sugar cane, you consume that sugar mm -hmm. and you don't have food and fuel. You just have the fuel. So they want to go strictly to corn production of bioethanol because they've figured out that with corn production, you get the fuel and you get the feed, which is mm -hmm. much better for them. And it will it will really spark uh, probably an agricultural revolution in, in India. That's exciting. But yeah. And then mm -hmm. from a. Other product standpoint, CO2, CO2 is naturally absorbed by the corn plant as it grows. And then when it comes into our plant and goes through fermentation, we can capture that CO2. And we capture the CO2 at about a dozen of our plants, and we sell it into the food grade market for everything from dry ice to the bubbles in your, your Coke or Budweiser. Mm -hmm. um, and so... None of that, none of the corn that comes into a plant goes to waste. That's a really important aspect too. We don't, we don't waste anything. We don't waste any water. We don't waste any nutrition. We don't waste any energy. It's mm. all used in a very efficient process. Yeah, that's really amazing. Um, and I know that there are other products that, you know, Poet has also supported with corn oil and things like that. Um, so you're right that you really utilize every part of that corn kernel. Um, so there's a lot of benefits coming out of corn-based bioethanol, um, but there's also this important consideration around the feedstock itself, which you touched on, um, you know, and the basis for that feedstock, which is agriculture. And so, you know, we we're hearing these arguments about food versus fuel. People are afraid that crops for food um, are being used or land for food is being used for fuel instead. And so the agricultural space in the U.S. has um, changed. What does it look like today in terms of the land that's being used for energy crops um, like bioethanol versus food? And how has that shifted over the last few decades? Yeah, that's a good question, Alicia. The The land use has not changed much at all over the years. Um, mm. We really don't need more land. We just need to manage the land that we currently have properly. Um, I'll give you a, just a touch of history uh, because it's important to point out what the future holds. So, you know, in the, in the mid to late 80s, agriculture was dying literally dying. Suicide rates were high. Bankruptcies were high. Um, there was just too much grain on the market. And when you have a, an oversupply of grain, you have poor pricing. So the, hmm. the value of the product was less than the cost of production. And that was really that was really hard on farmers. And so the U.S. government started paying farmers not to farm 20 percent of their land. That's how much oversupply there was. Wow. The Bruins really didn't want to set aside their land, so they built a small ethanol plant on the family farm, hmm. and that helped balance their grain markets on, on the farm. And then they ended up buying a, a bankrupt, defunct uh, ethanol plant in Scotland, South Dakota. Um, and, and when they got that up and running, um, word got out that the Bruins had a functional ethanol plant and they got calls from people saying, we have too much corn in our area. Can you build us an ethanol plant? Yeah, and so wow. they built a few ethanol plants for others. And that grew into, can you help us market the products? Can you help us manage or optimize the plant? And so that's how, that's how the company formed. And that is really important because biofuels are what stimulated the resurgence of agriculture from mm. the 80s to today. 
you can track land values all the way from 1980 to today and land values and incomes on on farm incomes track exactly with uh, biofuels growth. So biofuels are soaking up surplus grain. That's a critical aspect because if grain is, if, if the value of grain is under the cost of production, we send cheap subsidized grain all around the world and we stifle global agriculture. If the U.S. farmer can't afford to farm, how can the rest of the world afford to farm? That's an important aspect. So a couple of key stats. Um, from the year 2000, when we really started growing, um, since the year 2000, there's been a billion people lifted out of extreme poverty around the world. And that's because we've supply, we have balanced the supplies of grain and allowed farming to become more prevalent in other areas. So if we're not sending cheap grain around the world, people will produce for themselves. And that is, that is, um, that's a critical aspect. So when we talk about all the benefits of bioethanol, whether that's the lowering of greenhouse gas emissions, the lowering of cost of fuel, um, domestic production leads to um, energy security in our country. All those things are wonderful. But the best benefit that bioethanol has is its benefit to agriculture, exactly what you're getting at. Um, we have created a blueprint in the Midwest over the last 20 to 40 years that can be replicated around the world. Imagine if you put 200 ethanol plants in African countries. Mm -hmm. Just think of the agricultural resurgence and the economic boom that would happen around those plants. In mm -hmm. the United States, an ethanol plant, an average ethanol plant provides about $200 million worth of economic activity in a small area. That wow. is really critical. And so from the 80s to today, you've seen rural America um, thrive again. Um, and I think we can do that in places like Africa, India, China, places, Latin America, places that are struggling to get a foothold because their agriculture hasn't taken off. Mm -hmm. They need more markets for their agricultural products um, because cheap grain means you can't produce, you can't afford to farm. You need a margin in agriculture. And then I, I'll say one more thing and then I'll, I'll stop rambling, Alicia. But one saying that we use around here a lot is that Biofuels are the catalyst for successful agriculture, hmm. and successful agriculture is key to solving some of the world's most pressing issues, whether that's climate change, poverty, hunger, disease. There's not another industry other than agriculture that can do that, and the only market that can grow fast enough to keep up with agricultural technology today is biofuels. Biofuels is that catalyst for successful agriculture, and we've seen the proof of that in the Midwest over the last 30, 40 years. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that we're really passionate about at Pivot, too, is it's exciting to see that when you're promoting biofuels, whether that's for cooking or transportation or, or other spaces, you really begin to boost that very initial part of the supply chain, the agricultural space, and boost those rural incomes where they need it the most. So. Um, it's awesome to hear you talk about it like that and how much revitalization happened in the U.S. over the space of the last 30 to 40 years because of biofuels. Um, and I want to touch a little bit. It, it is a different situation in the global south, right? They don't have necessarily the same techniques that we have for farming. They don't have the same capacity. If you were to put 200 ethanol plants in sub-Saharan Africa right now, they might not have enough. Um, grain or sugarcane or cassava to supply those plants. So um, I'd like you to talk a little bit on some of the things that have optimized farming in the U.S. and why we're able to still produce high yields on the same amount of land that we did 30 years ago. Yeah, the technology in agriculture is uh, really exciting. I mean, seed traits, drought resistant traits, uh, just the seed technology alone uh, is fantastic. But then when you include what the farmers are doing with their land, uh, improving soil organic carbon, no-till, 
uh, precision fertilizer, those types of things. The farmers are, are taking better care of their land than ever before. And that's because they're learning that value of, of the land. Well, they, they're not learning it. They've always known it, but the tools are better to supply them mm -hmm. um, yeah. with managing their land. And then you've got the technology from the OEMs, um, tractors and combines that are GPS. Um, you've got drones that can fertilize very specific areas. You've got um, GPS mapping that shows where to fertilize, when and how, and how much to apply. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting. We've talked to some of the the leading companies in in agriculture, and they're excited. One person actually said, you know, we've been growing corn forever, but we're just learning how to grow the corn in the United mm -hmm. States. So we are going to more than double um, double output of corn on the same amount of land uh, in the not too distant future. Again, we've been doubling over the past, but now that technology just seems to be um, increasing exponentially because they have learned so much about the corn plant. Now, when we talk about Africa and other developing um, countries, um, you're right. We can't do it overnight, but you have to start somewhere. And mm -hmm. where you start your proper agricultural techniques. Uh, Poet has a, a philanthropic arm called Seeds of Change. And we've been working with farmers in Africa, giving them the latest seed technology, some new techniques, just better management practices. And um, we've been seeing that over two growing seasons, we're getting a, a five to nine X yield increase in corn production. So we know that. African countries are very capable of producing more, but yeah. if we're talking about putting bioethanol plants there, that's going to be a gradual thing, as it was a gradual sure. thing in the United States as well. We can't expect things to happen overnight, but I think we can expect things to dramatically improve over time. Look, um, you start providing markets for, for grains in Africa, and that, that is going to give them a margin. Rather than just mm -hmm. providing for their own family, they can provide for the area. Um, and and that means there's going to be a margin in agriculture. When there's a margin, mm -hmm. that leads to investment. And investment leads to innovation. And innovation leads to infrastructure. And that's what is going to allow us to help Africa and other countries meet their potential of agriculture. Because right now, um, you know, the United States produces produced 177 bushels of, of corn last year, national average in drought conditions, whereas mm -hmm. the rest of the world averages about 60 bushels per acre. We're wow. 177. The rest of the world is averaging 60, 60 bushels. Just think of the yeah, potential double. out there. Um, if we if we managed agriculture and and managed supplies of grains better than we do, and like I said before, Biofuels are about the only mechanism that can grow fast enough to be able to manage that supply and demand sector. So that's mm -hmm. really exciting. And that's why I keep saying I think the, the greatest benefit of bioethanol today is what it can do for agriculture around the world. Yeah. And I think that's really key because in a lot of these conversations we're having with countries that want to implement blending or want to implement clean cooking with bioethanol, there is still that underlying food versus fuel um, threat. You know, that's something that's in the back of everyone's mind. I, I had a workshop this morning on standards and that definitely came up as part of the conversation was, well, you know, in Africa, we are eating the yellow number two corn or other types of corn that you wouldn't use in the U.S. for human consumption. Um, we are, you know, using sugarcane and molasses and other feedstocks. Um, how do we make sure that we're not impacting the food supply? And so to talk about those margins, like you bring in some of the resources where you're having better seed technology or having better planting techniques, um, some things where Africa can really leapfrog um, because of the technology that exists today. And they can skip the 30 years of learning that the U.S. did um, and really start implementing some of those 
other technologies to improve yields and then begin building that margin and creating market demand. And um, so I think that is really key to note that it's going to take time, but it can happen. Um, and Africa can very much produce their own food and fuel. Right. And another thing I was asked recently, well, if we are, what if we have a disruption in the supply? What if we have a, mm. a drought around the world and, and we're using all this uh, grain for biofuel production and that? And, mm -hmm. you know, the answer is pretty simple. At least we have the grain there, right? If we don't, if we don't offer a market like fuel for corn, um, we're not going to produce that corn. And then if you're not producing that corn, um, you can't divert anything to the food supply. So you're mm -hmm. going to be much better off if you're producing uh, fuel and distillers grains and everything else. Um, you're going to be a lot safer because you could always siphon off some of that corn for food production uh, if there's more of it being produced and more of it being used. But if it's mm -hmm. if all you're doing is providing food with that grain and you have a disruption there you're going to have a major problem and that's what we, sure. we have seen that over time so i would say that the more the more fuel we're producing from corn especially um the more secure the food supply will be around the world and i hope i'm being mm -hmm. clear about that we're producing more grain on the same amount of land offering more security for your your energy needs as well as your food needs and that's critical the whole food versus fuel narrative is just wrong on every aspect and it's frustrating that people are still talking about it when we've got a 40-year history to show that we don't deplete the world of nutrition we enhance the world of nutrition the other thing alicia if you if you look at the growth of biofuels over the last 20 years and you put undernourishment around the world on that same graph, undernourishment mm -hmm. goes down while biofuels growth goes up. Hmm. That just proves that that supply is really helping from an economic standpoint, increase agricultural output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's definitely more um, consideration around that, I think. There's more research that's being poured into this. We're collaborating with um, GBEP and FAO who are doing nutrition studies around how nutrition improves when you introduce clean cooking, including bioethanol clean cooking, and how that enhances livelihoods and um, connected directly to that food supply and quality issue. So I think it's definitely something that people are looking at seriously and they want to have answers for it, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. The, the the market for clean cooking is obviously really large around the world. And I think that is going yeah. to be a great market for uh, countries because you're providing the fuel to cook with, along with the food you're going to cook, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> what, a, what a fantastic um, opportunity for developing nations to start slow, gradually mm -hmm. move in. But yeah, the security for energy and food is going to be much greater if we're if we're creating additional markets for those grains. There, there's just mm -hmm. no question about it. Yeah, absolutely. So as Sub-Saharan Africa looks to implement bioethanol economies, a lot of countries are getting interested in this, not only for cooking, but for blending with transportation as well. Um, what are some considerations that they should um, look at when they're exploring building these economies and expanding their ag sector? Well, I think, first of all, they've got to, they need to set standards in their country that uh, allow imports to start. And let me mm -hmm. just give you a, an example. When, when the United States passed the renewable fuel standard, um, we couldn't supply our own bioethanol. We didn't have enough production. But um, providing a market there and importing ethanol from Brazil showed us that we can grow our, our biofuel market internally and, mm -hmm. and not have to depend on imports from other countries. And I think that's an important aspect sure. for a number of African countries uh, to consider, because if you don't have the market, you're not going to have the certainty to invest in those markets. And so 
that's one thing that I would do. You got to make sure the the standards are right. You've got to make sure that the the duties and tariffs and things like that uh, aren't aren't high that well, that um, make it hard for exporters to export into those countries because mm -hmm. um, it has to start with a lot of countries by importing these products and then that will that will encourage internal production uh and and i think that's probably the key aspect uh in growing some of these markets in in african mm. countries um but yeah you deal with tariffs and astm standards and things like that yeah and you know it it shouldn't be all that hard to make those things right um for these countries but i know it's more difficult than than you might think sometimes but i just hope that as countries get more and more serious about this you've got to set the standards right and you've got to set the standards high higher than what mm -hmm. can be produced in that country to start with um, so that there is there are goals out there to bring in uh your own production into play Absolutely. Yeah. Having that regulatory certainty and making sure that you have this enabling environment in place is really a big part of the foundation of growing bioethanol globally. And um, so, and we're seeing countries do that, right? We're seeing um, some trans transitions start to take place. Uh, we just finished a standards workshop in Mozambique the end of last month, and they're going to start putting standards in place, even just around fuel blends so that they can actually get fuel in place into the country. And so steps like that are really important to beginning uh, the market demand that's uh, going to take the sector to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. I We've both agreed that it's not going to happen overnight, but you set mm -hmm. the right standards today and 20 years from now, you're going to look back and say, I wish we would have done that 40 years ago or 50 years ago yeah. because <laughs> The egg, you know, in the United States, less than 2% of our population considers themselves farmers. In mm -hmm. Africa, I'm sure it's the majority of the population in Africa considers themselves to be farmers, right? Think about how critical agriculture is to these nations. And if there aren't any markets for it and there aren't any incentives uh, to improve it, um, it's not going to change. Right. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we talk all, all the time about energy security in the United States, but I, I would argue that it's more dangerous for developing nations to depend on the United States for its grain than it is for the United States to depend on the Middle East for its oil. Both are mm -hmm. critical. Mm -hmm. Right. But, yeah, at some point, um, Africa and other developing areas around the world. Um, are going to see an agricultural resur resurgence that we've seen in the United States. It, I think it's inevitable, but it's it's going to take mm -hmm. a little time. Yeah, it will. But I think you're right in that you know biofuels can really act as a catalyst for that, and so that's really exciting. And it's exciting to be in an industry where we're part of that and um, can help participate and provide resources and education and um, have conversations like this, where it, you know we just get more information around a subject that we might not know a lot about. So I really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing your expertise. Um, just being very candid and um, explaining the the topic in a very clear way. I think it's going to be really interesting for our listeners. Good. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. And um, if if people need more information, it, we can provide that to them as well, Alicia. I know that you've got my contact information as you get yep. questions. Please pass them on. We want to make Absolutely. sure that we're educating the world on this. It's a, it's a critical subject, and we've just got to clear, clean up the misconceptions out there. And everything that I've shared with you yeah. today is factual based on numbers and stats and, and history. So that's exciting. Yeah. Well, we very much appreciate it. I have one more question for you. I have a, a, my typical food-related question, and that is, if you could be an expert at cooking one thing, what would it be and why? Okay. Um, 
Well, this is so I'm going to go a little bit broad with this, but I would say seafood. Okay. Oh, okay. I think seafood cooked right is the best, well, some of the best food on the planet. <laughs> seafood cooked poorly is not very good. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it can be the best or the worst. Yeah. So I would have to say seafood. I don't cook a lot of seafood and uh, I would love to eat more. So I'd have to go with the, the entire seafood chain. Okay. Wow. That's awesome. You might also have to move to somewhere that's not landlocked <laughs> so you can practice more. Well, well, we, we don't have a whole lot of seafood that uh, is, <laughs> is uh, grown in South Dakota, but we're trying to improve that. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Doug, I really appreciate it. And um, just thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Thank you, Alicia. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. With over a third of the world's population lacking access to modern solutions and cooking with solid and polluting fuels like wood, charcoal, and kerosene, there are huge global impacts in multiple sectors. Pivot is passionate about opening access to household energy options around the world that also lead to reduced emissions, improved health outcomes, environmental protection, greater purchasing power, gender equity, and so much more. Join us for these personal conversations with farmers, fuel producers, distributors, stove manufacturers, policymakers, and consumers to learn about the dynamics that influence how people cook around the world. Please reach out to us at hello at pivotcleanenergy.org to find out how you can get involved. And we'd also be grateful if you found this information valuable and pass it along to friends, family, colleagues, your mailman, your grocer, anyone you know, and find some way to engage. Don't forget to follow us on our social media accounts like LinkedIn and Twitter. Check out our website at pivotcleanenergy.org. And of course, follow us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts so you can catch the next episode when it drops. Thank you.